what we're going to talk about this morning, we're going to pick up where we left off last Sunday morning. Last Sunday morning we asked the question that the Philippian jailer asked, what must I do to be saved? Amen? And we looked at the Apostle Paul's answer and he didn't say, go down here and be baptized. Then join our church, get your name on the roll, and go do some good works, and then you'll be saved. The Apostle Paul told him when he asked, what must I do to be saved? He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Hallelujah. That's what we... The Bible always answers its own questions. Amen? If we will look at it. And he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says the Philippian jailer was saved. Well, the ability to go get baptized, sure he did after he got saved. Did he receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues? I don't know. You tell me because it doesn't say. Salvation comes through faith in what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary. You can't add to that and you can't take away from that. How righteous you live doesn't make you holy. How good you live doesn't make you holy. Only the blood of Jesus makes you holy. When we stand before God, we will stand there righteous through the blood or we will stand there not righteous at all. Because it's only through the blood of Jesus that we are saved. And if you missed that, go back and listen to it. It'll bless you. This morning we're going to move on. Today we're going to talk about what must I do now that I am saved. Amen? Hallelujah. If you'll turn in the Word of God with me this morning to... Let me find... We're going to Matthew... We're going to, uh, Matthew I mean John, the fourth chapter. <laughs> we're going to John, the fourth chapter. Hallelujah. And we'll get there in a minute. Thank you, Lord. But last week as I was preaching, I said something. Every now and then I'll say something that I'll think, wow, that's good. It doesn't happen very often. But once in a blue moon, I'll say something that I'll think, wow, that's good. I might even think, it, I might even think that's deep. But in the end, I always think that's God. Amen? And what I said was this. The Lord didn't save you to seat you. The Lord saved you to send you. Amen? He never called anyone and told them, okay, now don't you go nowhere, don't you do anything. You just sit there. He never called any person. He never saved them, called them and said, okay, you're saved. Now, you warm that pew, that spot on the pew every Sunday morning and everything's okay. Amen? When we become born again, whenever we get saved, that's not the end. That's the beginning of our journey with the Lord. We're not supposed to sit there and say blessed assurance and never move. We're supposed to be a light to a world that is lost in such gross, thick darkness that they cannot find their way. Every one of us today are called to be a light to the world. Amen? Amen. There is a blessed assurance that we should always rest in. There is a confidence. And you should not wonder, well, I don't know if I'm saved or not. You can know that you know that you know. I've heard people over the years say, well, I hope I'm saved. You should know that you're saved. I hope I'm right with the Lord. No, you should know that you're right with the Lord. And if your faith is in what He did on the cross of Calvary, then you are right with the Lord. I heard one old saint say one time, if I can just make it in by the skin of my teeth. No, if you make it in, it'll be by the blood of Jesus. Amen. So today we can know and we can have that assurance and we should always rest in that. But we should never become complacent. We should never become so at ease in Zion that we think visiting the church three times a week is all that needs to be done. There should be a fire burning in us today to share Jesus with somebody else. Man. I thought this morning as I was looking over my notes and I didn't put this down, but I thought how the people will go on a diet and they'll find this great new diet and they'll begin to lose weight and they can't wait to share it with somebody else because the change it's made in their life. That's the way we should be with Jesus today. He should make such a change, accepting and putting our faith in Him, make such a change in our life that we should not be able to wait to share Him with somebody else. To let them know what He has done for us. People don't hesitate to share with you how much weight they've lost on Weight Watchers or some of the meals you order through the mail that you see the commercials for and all of that. I hear from people all the time saying, I've lost this much weight. I did it this way. Send me a message and I'll tell you how to do it. Well, our message today to, should be, Jesus saved me, brought me up out of a miry pit, set my feet on a rock to stay. Let me tell you how He can do that for you. Let me tell you how you can get what I got. Amen. 
So once we get saved, it's not just like we're done. I'm just going to sit here. No, when the Lord saved you, He didn't save you to seek you. He saved you to send you. Amen? Everyone who is saved, everyone who has been touched by the hand of the Lord is called to do something for the Lord. Now, you may not be called to preach. You may not be in, not in behind the pulpit anyway. You may not be called to teach Sunday school. You may not be called to sing or to lead song service. But you're called to be a light to a lost and dying world. The truth of the matter is you may be, and this is an old song, but there's so much truth in it. You may be the only Bible that some people ever read. The influence that you have on their life may be the only thing that stands between them and eternity in hell. The light that you shine, the witness that you are, the influence that you are, Brother Tyler, may be the only thing that stands between someone's soul and eternity in hell. All of us are an influence to someone. All of us have an opportunity to be a light to someone. You may not be on television, you may not be on the internet, but as a, that doesn't change the fact that you interact with people, that you may be the only one that can show them the light. I don't care how big the ministry is, and I'll use Brother Swaggart's ministry because we're affiliated with them and, and we support them, and, and, and that's the only ones that we support that are on television. But and, and talk about how big it is and all and how many satellites they're on and how many cable stations they're on and, and the radio stations and all the things that they do, but there are still countless people they will never reach. There are countless souls that they will never reach. Why? Because there are some people, you talk, they don't even know who they are. They don't know nothing about the station. They don't know nothing about their television station. None of that. There are some people that they will never be able to reach, but you can. No matter how big the ministry is. We can talk about Billy Graham and how in his day, how that it was so, his crusades were so packed, but there are countless souls that Billy Graham was never able to reach. And it'll be that way. It'll always be that way. Never think, never get the mentality that you think, well, we're the, we're the ministry that was called to do all this and nobody else can do it. It takes the entire body of Christ working to get the gospel out to a lost and dying world. There are people that you will reach that no one else can reach. There are people that you interact with that you can let your light shine into their darkened lives. And listen, people are looking for a light. Then they walk around with a smile on their face. But inside, without Jesus, I don't care how happy you think you are, just under that layer of temporal peace, just under that layer of, layer of temporal joy, there is a missing part to, to your soul that can only be filled with Jesus Christ. Amen? The old song that says only Jesus can satisfy your soul. No truer words have ever been written. If you know Jesus, you can know true peace. But if you don't know Jesus, you'll have no peace. Amen? Today, Jesus Christ is the missing part piece to the puzzle that makes you whole and you will never be whole without Him. Amen. You will never be whole without Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And He's called us today as born again believers to be the light of the world. I told you that the Lord never called anybody and told them to sit down. We talked about Amos. The prophet Amos. And if you go over there and read the book, the book of Amos is, you don't hear a lot of preaching out of it, but it's a wonderful book. How that the Lord called him. They said, he, the, 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 he, they called it, the Lord called him and he preached and, and they came and told him and I felt like this before they came and told him that you need to go somewhere else and preach because we don't want to hear you. Amen. And he said, wait a minute. I was not a prophet. Neither was my father a prophet. I was the keeper of the sycamore trees. And the Lord took me. He called me. And he told me to sit down and not do anything. No, he told Amos to go and to preach the message. When he called Isaiah, he said, go. When he called Moses on the backside of the desert, he said, go. Tell Pharaoh to let my people go. He didn't call Moses on the backside of the desert and say, okay, you stay here and keep the sheep. No, he said, go. When he called Jonah, even though Jonah, you know the story, rebelled and ran the other way. But when he called Jonah, the Bible says, the word of the Lord came into Jonah. He said, arise and go. He doesn't call you and say, stay where you're at. He calls you to be a light. He calls you to be a witness. He calls you to go. 
into the world. Not to be some recluse or to have some kind of... You know, we've got people who... They'll have compounds where they'll a lot of families will gather. Or they'll have just these select villages. I've known of, a, I've known of a few in Tennessee where these people would gather and make their own community. And they would withdraw themselves from the world so that they wouldn't be tainted of the world and they wouldn't be part of the world system. That's not what God's called us to do. Listen, we are, we are in the world, but we're not of the world. Amen? Amen? We have to be a part of the world because we are the light. He left us to be the light of the world. Amen? So when He called these men, when He called Isaiah, He said, go. Amos, He said, go. Jonah, He said, go. When He called you, He said, go. He's everyone in the sound of my voice. If you're saved, He's told you to go. Go and be the light that you're supposed to be. He didn't tell us to go big, go and build big buildings. He didn't say go and build some recreation areas and some theme parks so Christians will have somewhere to go and entertain themselves and, and relax. You won't find that in the Word of God. He didn't say go and build big movie studios so that you can entertain people. Theme parks, concert halls. He said go and preach the gospel. Go and be the light that you're supposed to be. Amen. Whenever he told he commissioned the church in Mark 16 and 15, he said to them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Preach the gospel to every creature. And no matter who you are today, if you're saved, if you're born again, you're to carry this message in one way or the other. In your life, in your testimony, in your daily witness. And of course, we're supposed to support the work of God, the, the uh, spreading of the gospel with our prayers and with our finances. Because it's only the gospel is the only answer for, the, for what ails mankind. As you can see, Donald Trump is not the hope for America. I'm glad he's the president. I'm really, 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 really glad that Hillary didn't win. But the hope for America is Jesus Christ. Amen. Always has been and always will be. Amen. Because the problem with America is not, a, is not a political one. The problem with America is a spiritual one. And there's only one healing balm for that. And that's Jesus Christ and what He did on the cross of Calvary. But whenever He commissioned the church, He told them to go into the world and preach the gospel. So no matter who you are, go with me to Matthew 5 and 13. We'll get to John in a minute. Matthew 5 and 13. Matthew the 5th chapter, the 13th verse. We're going to look this morning and see what we're supposed to do once we're born again. You mean, Brother Billy, I'm not just supposed to go to church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and a midweek service, and that's it. I'm done. That's all. That's all my obligation. No. Your obligation is to be the light of the world, to be the salt of the earth. Let's see what the words of Jesus said here. Matthew 5 and 13. You are the salt of the earth. Now listen to me. He's talking to you, born again believer. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. And I always say this when I read this verse. I know that salt is used to, to preserve. But salt also, if you know, and I'm sure you do, you've ate things that were salty before, it makes you what? thirsty. So if you are the salt of the earth, we should make people thirsty today. Thirsty for what Jesus has done in our lives. Thirsty for the relationship that we have for Him. But sadly, much of the church, you know what they offer? Have you ever heard of a mirage? If you've ever seen an old western or something, there'd be somebody out in the desert and they're lost and they can't find any water and they're crawling through the sand and off in the distance they see what they think is a beautiful river or a stream or a pond or a lake or something. Maybe a, maybe a lemonade stand. <laughs> but something that they believe that's going to, that's going to quench their thirst. Amen. That's what most of the church offers today. A mirage to the world. And the world believes that because they're hot and they're thirsty and they're dry and they're dying, they believe that that will quench my thirst. 
So they press and they give what the church is offering, but it just leaves them broken down and drier than they were before because the church is offering everything but the answer for mankind. Yes. Your self-help books will not do it. Amen. Your preacher that stands in the pulpit in front of thousands on Sunday morning and says, you're okay, I'm okay, think positive, be positive, have your best life now, will leave you broken down and undone because the only hope for mankind is found in the pages of this book between Revelation and Genesis and that hope is Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. There's only one hope for fallen man. And it's not your best life now. It's not a 40-step program from Rick Warren. It's not, it's not kneeling and, and confessing to a priest on Saturday night or Sunday morning. The only hope for America today is Jesus Christ and His shed blood. What He did on the cross. But Jesus says, you're the salt of the earth. You're supposed to make somebody thirsty for Jesus. Amen? But the only thing that the church is offering today is cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. And they leave the, they leave the world in as bad a shape as it was before it came. People flock to churches today with a longing and a hunger in their soul. And the only thing the church can offer is rap music or rock music or flashing lights, strobe lights, or smoke and mirrors. And none of that has anything to do with the moving of the Holy Spirit and the preaching of the Word of God. Man. Which is what the world so desperately needs. The scripture I was going to have you to go to, you don't have to, but because we're going to read more in Matthew, the fifth chapter, was in John 14, uh, John the fourth chapter, where Jesus was talking to the woman at the well, and he said, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. That can be applied to that which the church offers today. 95% of the church is offering you something that will cause you to thirst again. But Jesus told this woman, But if you'll take of the water that I offer, if you'll take of the water that I offer you today, and He's saying that to fallen man, He's saying that to the church today, if you'll drink of Me, you'll never thirst again. You won't want to drink of the broken cisterns of the world. Once you've had a taste of Jesus, nothing else is going to satisfy you. Once you've had a taste of His Holy Spirit, once you've had a taste of Him, and we should make people thirsty for a taste of Jesus today. The love that they see in our life, the change, the relationship with the Lord. What's He going to say there in Matthew 5? Verse 14, You're the light of the world. He's talking to you. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. This light that is in us, this Jesus that is in us cannot be hid. And if you try, you'll find yourself miserable like Jeremiah was when he said it's like a fire that was shut up in my bones. And I tried to hide it. I tried to sit on it. I tried to sit down and shut up, but I couldn't. That's the way it should be with us today. We should, have, we should be compelled to share Jesus with someone. A city that is set on a hill cannot be healed. Neither can the Jesus in you. Not once you've been saved and born again. What's He going to say? Matthew 5 and 15. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. He's still talking about you. Amen? You who are saved. Amen? You who have Jesus in you who is the light that makes you be the light of the world. And what happens when you light a candle and you put it on a candlestick? It says it gives light into the whole house. But what happens to that same candle if you hide it under a bushel? Can somebody tell me what happens to a candle if you cut off any oxygen to it? goes out. That's what happens when you try to hide your light. I told you before about the lumberjack who came down out of the mountains and got saved at the tent meeting and went back up to work and he wasn't going to be able to come back down for six months and the preacher said we better pray for him. And guys at the lumber camp, they're rough people. They'll give him a hard time of it. He comes down six months later. He comes to the tent meeting that they're having then and, and they say, well, we've been praying for you. We know it was going to be hard. He said, well, it wasn't hard. I just didn't let them know I got saved. 
If nobody knows you got saved, you might as well go back to the altar. Because you might not. Because when you hide this light, it goes out. But this light was not meant to be hidden. It was meant to put on a candlestick and give light where? It said to give light unto all that are in the house. When you walk into a room, your light, His light in you, should lighten that, should brighten that room up. Listen to me. If you go places where you can't let your light shine, let me give you some advice this morning. Don't go back. Amen? Amen? If you find yourself in places where you cannot allow your light to shine when given the opportunity or to share Jesus with somebody, when given the opportunity or the doors open, when you, if you fellowship those places, quit going to those places. Because you're not doing yourself any good or them. As a matter of fact, you're harming. You're doing more harm than good. Because this light is meant to be put on a candlestick and give light to those that are in darkness. You may be the only lighthouse in the midst of someone else's storm. That's why it's so important what we say and what we do and the way we treat others, especially when we're out in public. Of course, we should do this when we're at home, but especially whenever you're out in public. Because you don't just represent you. You don't just represent, I don't just represent the Douglas bloodline or the Douglas clan. I represent the King of glory. Amen. Jesus, and every one of us had fell short of this. How many times have you walked away thinking, I should have acted better than I acted? Amen. I should have said something different than what I said. I should have showed them, oh, I couldn't preach this morning. What? I said, I couldn't preach this morning. Amen. Amen. How many times have you walked away with your tail between your legs thinking, I'm ashamed of the way that I acted? Amen. Amen. We need to stop, think, and then act. Of course, we don't do that a lot of times. But we need to realize today that our actions influence the lives of others. Amen? Amen. And the light that we shine, that may be the only thing standing between someone and hell. Amen? It giveth light unto all the house. You are the light of the world. The world itself is in darkness and knows no light. I heard Brother Randy Anderson tell one time, he said he was out coon hunting with his dad. They were way back deep in the woods. It was nighttime, of course, and he, was, he got sick in his stomach. And his dad told him, okay, son, will you go on home? And he said, well, it's dark. I don't know how. And his dad said, you see that light way over there? That's our porch light. And Brother Randy said, it's the only light he could see. And his dad said, if you go toward that light, it'll lead you home. We should be the light today in the darkness of the lives of others that will lead them home. Amen. You may be the lighthouse that keeps them from going astray. You may be. We need to pray that. We need to pray, Lord, help me to be a witness for You every day of my life. Help me to be a light. Help me to be a benefit to those that I come in contact with. Amen. Listen, he's not through. Verse 16, and I'm getting ready to close. He says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Not so that you'll get a pat on the back. Not so that you'll get the accolades of man. But so that you will be a light to people and an influence on them in such a great way that they will realize that God has done something in your life. I was reminded this week of a story that I heard a preacher tell. I was listening to the sermon again. And it's a Jewish story. It's a legend. It's no, no way of backing this up. But he was talking about how the, the story goes like this, that Jesus and His disciples were sitting around the campfire one night and Jesus was teaching them and that John the Beloved noticed that on the wall behind the Savior, because of the fire, lit the light from the fire, that on the wall behind where the Savior was at was His shadow on the wall. And the story says that the, John the Beloved picked up a stone and he outlined the shadow of the Savior on the rock. And the story goes on to say that later on, of course, the Jews crucified the Lord and said that that 
that outline of the Lord's shadow on the rock that after the Lord was crucified that there would be people that would come that way and they would stand there in the light of the sun with their shadow cast and they would try to feel that shadow that the Lord had left that John had drawn on the rock. It said that, that wealthy men would try to feel it and that men of, of well acclaimed men would come by and they would try to see if their shadow fit the shadow of the Savior. But none was able to until one day along came an humble man, a meek man, not a wealthy man, but someone that helped others as much as he could. And as he walked along his way and he came near to the wall where it was drawn, he stopped to help an old beggar on his way. And he said everyone around was stopped and their mouth fell open because as the sun shone on that man and his shadow went on, that, on the wall as he was helping that beggar, his shadow filled the shadow of the Lord that was on the wall. Amen. That's the way it should be with us today. We should ask ourselves, and not just as some bracelet or necklace or some catchy theme song, what would Jesus do? We're supposed to be His reflection to a world that is lost and undone. His light to a world that is in darkness and lost and on their way to hell. They should see Jesus in you today. You're the light of the world. Amen? Amen? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Like I said, you may not be called to preach. You may not be, not be called to say. You may not be called to teach Sunday school. But you are called unequivocally and undeniably to be the light of the world. If you have Jesus in you, and listen, if you're not saved, that's the easy part. He's already did the hard part. Amen. All you have to do is put your faith and your trust in Jesus and what He did on the cross. Say, Lord, be my Lord and Savior, Jesus. Forgive me of my sins. And He will do that. Once that happens, we're not called to sit. We're called to go. We're called to be a light. We're not called to take this light that is in us and try to hide it from the world. But to put it on a candlestick and let it shine. This thing that Jesus did was not done in a corner. It was done in the open for all men to see. And the same thing should be for your salvation as that is. That should be the same way for your salvation today. He didn't save you so you wouldn't tell nobody. He saved you so you would tell somebody. Amen. He saved you to be a light, to be a witness, to be the reflection of Jesus, to show people the way to Him. Amen. Amen. The Bible says in Ephesians 4 and 29, you can write this down, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. Now listen to what he says that it may minister grace unto the hearers. That lets me know that the things that I say can minister to people. We can either minister good or we can minister bad. Listen to what he said in 1 Peter 3 and 15. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you. Now why would anybody ask you unless they first saw it in you? Be ready to answer, give an answer to any man who asks you of the reason. Why are you so hopeful? Why do you have this joy? Why do you have this peace? I'm so glad you asked. Jesus. Don't answer my well, I go to church every Sunday because there's a lot of miserable people in church every Sunday. Amen. Some of the most miserable, sired people I ever met, hateful, was in church every Sunday. Oh, why didn't you? Amen. Tell them Jesus got a hold of my life and He won't let me go. Amen. Amen. So we should be a light for them to run to. We should be salt that makes them thirsty. We should show them enough of Jesus in our life that they come to us and say, how do you get through it? You've been through a lot, but I noticed you've got peace. I noticed you've got joy. How to, what, what, is, what is it that causes this? And you can turn to them and say, it's not a what, it's a who. Jesus Christ has saved my life. Amen. And this can be applied to even the simplest things. Amen. That long line you don't like to get in at the dollar store that reaches from the front halfway to the back. 
And the people all around you are growling and complaining and you're standing there with a smile on your face. I just don't understand him. I don't understand her. How are you still happy? Oh, I'm glad you asked me. Amen. Glory to God. Jesus got a hold of me. Jesus Christ is my hope. He's my joy. Amen. He's my peace. And we're supposed to not take that. And well, Jesus saved me. Now I just got to go to church every Sunday morning. And that's it. No, you're supposed to be the light. You're supposed to be a witness to people. And you really are, whether you realize it or not. You're witnessing to people. Sometimes it ain't such a good witness. Sometimes it is. Amen. I don't know about you, but I want it to be good. The Bible says that we are epistles. Amen. Read of all men. That's 2 Corinthians 3 and 2. It really is true that you're the only Bible that some people ever read. And your light, your life, may be the only thing that stands between them and hell. Your presentation of the Gospel your light that you shine into their darkness. Your example may be the only thing that stands between them and hell. It may be what causes them to turn to Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let your light shine before men so they'll see your good works and glorify you. That's why for so long I've said, go out that door and be the light that you're supposed to be and share the love of Jesus with everyone you can. Because some of the people that you meet, you don't know that they have a tomorrow. That may be your last opportunity to let your light shine in their life. Amen. Amen. Someone else this morning. I have something before we go.